you can make yourself better in so many other areas. It's just uh, just mentally and physically, this is a test of who you are. Hey there, everyone. It's episode 40 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Master Anthony Graff. I'm your host, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also Whistlekick's founder. Here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories, all for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of the returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out what we offer, like our great Cloud9 sweatpants. They're so comfortable, we routinely have parents complaining to us that their children won't take them off to be washed. You can learn more about our sweatpants and all of our great gear and apparel at whistlekick.com. All of our past podcast episodes, show notes for this one, and a lot more are over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for a newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. But let's talk about today's episode. On episode 40, we're joined by Master Anthony Graff, an incredibly accomplished Taekwondo athlete. His list of accomplishments is long, but let me sum it up for you. Master Graff was an alternate to the USA Olympic team in both 2004 and 2008. He's now a martial arts school owner, coach, and offers up some great insights into the world of competitive martial arts and what it truly takes to be successful inside and outside the ring. So with that, Master Graff, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Oh, thank you. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm doing great today. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. We're having uh, kind of your type of weather up here in Vermont. It's uh, 72 degrees out here right now. Nice. Which is awesome. really weird. It makes stacking wood and doing all that other winter prep that we have to do up here kind of kind of strange because it awesome. feels like summer is never going to end. But all right, super cool. For for me, that my yeah. my uh, my winter prep is jumping in my pool. <laughs> nice, nice. I'll have to come down and visit you when it when the snow is up to my neck, which Thanks. could happen. Nice. Always in three welcome. Weeks here. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, cool. Um, let's jump into it. Why don't you tell me, tell the listeners how you got started in the martial arts? All right. So, um, a couple different reasons. Um, you know, as a kid, I had some um, some challenges with anger. Um, I began uh, gaining a ton of weight and. Um, we went to the doctor, my mother and I, and we found out that I was, yeah, had slight scoliosis. So, um, you know, I loved martial arts. You know, I was a big fanatic of, you know, I grew up in a video game generation, but we were just, you know, I'd play every, I had every martial arts game. I had, I had made my own weapons, you know, I was a, I was a boy, you know, and, um, yeah. and, uh, you know, putting me in a martial arts school, um, it, it, you know, it just changed my life. Unfortunately, I was, you know, I was in, a, in the right place at the right time with the right people. And, um, you know, we had, a, I had some great mentors that I had fallen upon and, and they, they changed my life. You know, they, you know, I, I was, uh, I learned to control my anger. Um, my scoliosis fixed itself. And, um, I, you know, after four years of, um, doing martial arts, I became a, an adult national champion, you know, beating the U S national team member. Uh, and I was rich. <laughs> so I went wow. from a chubby little bunny. To uh, uh, you know, a rock, and that's very empowering for somebody to, to change their life in that direction. That's quite the transformation, and I think it illustrates a really good point. Whether it's martial arts or it's life, so often we look at the end result, and and you know, we're going to have some photos up of you on the website, and you know, let, let's let's be honest, you've achieved a, a, le- a level of physical fitness that most of us would hope for, and. and some of us strive for, and very few of us get to. But it's really easy when you're looking at that end result to forget all the hard work and, you know, the starting point that we Absolutely. all have. Absolutely. I think it was, you know, it's very, and also to, to see the transition from starting in a position where, you know, uh, you, you, that you never want to, you know, the Jewish people have the thing, that never again moment, you know, where they never will have, go back to that, being like that again. Because this is very, you know, I, I've had these anger issues because I was very uncomfortable in my own body and unhappy with myself, and I didn't have an identity, and um, and uh, my identity became my fitness and uh, my my martial arts. So awesome. So you got started in martial arts. Now, was that taekwondo that you, I, you I started in? Yeah, I started in taekwondo. I started with under uh, 
Uh, I started actually in a, a local community center, and then um, I actually um, then I shortly after that um, I had stumbled upon a, uh, a Master Peter Bardatos, um, who is a, a a national team member seven times. He was uh, he trained under her Perez. Her Perez was also one of my um, 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 mentors of growing up. And these these guys are the, the the cream of the crop in the United States, and um, it was kind of like the old school. You know, they threw you in the water, and you, you had to swim, or you uh, you were you were you were going to learn a, a, a rough lesson. So I I, le- I learned the hard way, and I, I but I was you know one of the uh, survivors, and I was able to come out of it, and I came out on top, and I'm very grateful. That's great. So I'm sure with all of your success and all the things that you've done in the martial arts, you've had a chance to travel, and you've probably got some great stories. So I'd like you to tell us one of them. What's what's the best martial arts story you have to share with us? Um, I think it's probably um, overcoming a blown ACL. You know, um, I think that's, that is, that's one of my, um, yeah, man, I mean, like, after two, after Olympic trials in 04, I lost to uh, Steven Lopez. And, um, you know, we had a, uh, I, we had the, the, here in Miami in our training facility, we had a lot of Olympic team members from different countries come down and train. And I was like in phenomenal shape. And I just started, we were trained with those guys. And I probably had one of the best days in my life where I was just, just plowing through everybody. It's one of those days where you're hitting on all cylinders. I was, I, I had this chip on my shoulder for not going to the Olympic games. And, um, you know, and I'm, I was just doing some crazy stuff and I, or I heard a pop and I blew my ACL. And um, the way the the Olympic cycle was kind of built, um, I probably my my coach said, uh, you know, this is a really rough time because if our our national championships was coming up in a couple months, and if I didn't make um, team, um, I probably would be out for two years, and um, you know that would probably be bye bye for my career. I'd probably just call it quits right then and there, just for the cycle. And um, here's a, here's the dilemma. The doctor said I shouldn't even kick for nine months. So um, I sucked it up, you know. I trained, you know, around it, and uh, I uh, I I qualified for our team trials in three months. And in six months, um, I uh, my first fight out in um, for uh, for our U.S. team trials. Uh, I, I I was in such good shape. I had I broken a broken a guy's arm in my first kick out in my first fight. So, um, and honestly, I was, I, I was, I had another phenomenal day. I think I was so focused by, I, I, for two years, I pretty much didn't kick with one leg. I mean, I was able to use it lightly and uh, things, but, um, I was able to work around it and it was such a, uh, um, a challenge for me, you know? Um, and I, and then I, I, I took it as that, that thing to work through this diversity you know, and being able to overcome it and still be a better version of myself, even with my limitations. So I think that was my, for me, as far as uh, my character and uh, the, anything that I learned and my favorite uh, experience through, through the martial arts is that. It's overcoming um, this huge, huge obstacle where, where, you know, the doctors told me that I shouldn't even be, you know, throwing a kick. Nonetheless, I shouldn't be... Uh, uh, competing and having, you know, grown 190 pound men trying to kill me. Right. Well, I, I'm in my mind, I'm drawing a correlation between you and of course, Bill Wallace and who, you know, great friend of the show. We've had him on great guy. Uh, so, so you're in some good company there with having to spar with one leg, but I'd like you to take us back to kind of that rehab process. What did that look like? What was your emotional state? Well, I, I I knew one thing is that it's 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 hell. So um, because you're you're basically it's like starving, and then you know and you have to sit through turkey dinner every night, you know. Um, because what happened was I didn't let myself step out. I mean, three days out of a, a um, three days out of a torn ACL, I threw my crutches away. You know, a blown ACL, no ACL left. I I said that's it, no more. And I would go and I would go to training and I do everything I could do. If that makes any sense. I mean, I would do like, I would do, I was huge in my weight training at that time. My upper body was, I looked like, um, you know, like a tank, you know, and I, you know, and then, 
I was doing versions of cardio. I could only do closed chain activities. I was doing really, you know, interval stuff on aerodyne with arms only and things like this. And I was working through it. And then I would show up to training and I literally forced myself to go every night because it's about the ritual. It's about being there. It's about, you know, it's so easy. Once you, if I'm home, I can fall out of it so quickly. You know, I'm not keeping my eye on the prize. Being there in just being in, in the, the vicinity of other people. I was training, you know, I'm training my mind too. So I knew that I didn't want to miss a beat. And, um, it, it, uh, it was really, really, really challenging. Um, especially, you know, when you start being, when you start to move, because if you're training and you're trying to get back, it's two, it's two steps forward and then one step back and then two more steps forward and then three steps back because you feel the, pain and you're swelling and you're injured and you're stepping back again and then you're moving forward and back and forward so it's a constant battle within yourself and a real tip of your character well now would you say that after this experience would you say i don't want to put words in your mouth how would you say that it changed you on the um, other side it, it just one of the things that made me, is, uh, I think, it made me a little bit more patient. You know, I was a really, really active fighter, um, and it showed me that I could do a lot um, less and be more effective. Right? I was, I mean, not that if I was, when I, you know, prior to the injury, I was, over, I was all over you like white on rice. You know, um, and then I learned how to pick my shots a little bit more, be patient, control my breathing a little bit more. Um, you know, so it actually taught me a little, a, less, a big lesson in patience. And being more selective of what I was using, because you know, um, you know, I was becoming, uh, I was becoming a little bit weathered, and I had to be more selective about my shots, and I, I became more efficient. If that makes any sense. So, it um, makes all kinds of sense. Mm. Cool. So that's certainly a a challenging experience. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it was like to be on the track that you were on, and then just have to just stop. Um, you know, in terms of movies, it reminds me of Way of the Peaceful Warrior, the movie based on the Dan Millman book. If you or if any of the listeners have read that, it's a great book. I read it back when I was a teenager. But now when, when you train or now when you're working with other people with their training, how has that experience changed that? I mean, we, we just talked about how it changed your sparring game, how it changed you mentally. How has it changed the way you approach the physical aspect of martial arts? Um, well, so many different ways, you know. It's like, um, especially as far as that whole indomitable spirit thing. Um, I, I have a, a great template to kind of sh a story to share with my kids, uh, and also, um, you know, I also own a, a crossing facility. And if somebody gets injured who's training for a high level, we, you know, we're able to um, kind of give them a, a template. Say, hey, you guys, you can always work around it, you know. And there's also there's so many inspirational people. Um, um, that, that, uh, you know, we, especially now that we have the, uh, the, the, the para Olympics for, uh, for, for Taekwondo and, you know, we have people like Kyle Manor who compete in CrossFit. So that I, all these people that are, have these challenges, um, are, you know, they don't make excuses. They do what they're supposed to do. And, um, I, you know, I just try to use those stories and I try to say, Hey, you, big deal. You got a broken arm. You know, this guy doesn't have one, you know, and he, and he doesn't, you don't hear him complaining about it. So we kind of use that. And I say, this is always something you can do. You know, we have, I, you know, you can make yourself better in so many other areas. It's just, uh, just mentally and physically, this is a, a test of, of, of who you are. And, um, and that, that's probably the best thing to train more than anything else. The physical will, the, you can always train the physical, but if you take care of the mind, if you make your mind strong, everything else flows. Great. Yeah. So you mentioned CrossFit in there, and that's something that you and I have discussed that we have in common, you know, both our passion for martial arts as well as CrossFit. But I'd like to know for the people that are, are listening, of course, how have you incorporated CrossFit training and philosophies into the way you train and teach martial arts? Um, well, we have one of the largest kids fitness programs in the United States. Um, uh, and the reason is, is we, we do it differently. You know, we, we basically took the martial arts structure and we focus on uh, character first. You know, we don't, uh, it, it's so funny. I have, you know, I consult so many different 
people we have a, a, a we have a, a company called the Juice, Juice Athlete Compound, and um, we have a lot of people that we do remote coaching with and we consult them, and they have these limiting beliefs. They believe that uh, that like they have to their their goal is to train you know these kids that are already in sport like they're an athletic training facility. So we don't approach it like that. We approach it like we are just a training facility, and I have this level system, right? And it, um, my goal is to get the kid, kids off the couch that like that were like me, that weren't playing any sports, you know, and um, not the kids that are already athletically fit and you know varsity and killing it, right? I'm I'm trying to get and but I have a place for those guys too, and they all are they become these you know and in, in, in our community we call it fire breathers, right? So, um, but I want I've taken kids that, you know, and we have this level system, you know, just kind of like the martial arts, you have the t-shirt system and, um, and where they can earn, um, for example, if you're able to do uh, passes over the jump rope, five unbroken passes of the jump rope, I'm sorry, 10 unbroken passes of the jump rope, you earn a star on the back of your shirt. And then we have this, uh, this proven level system that we created that was based upon martial arts and, and, um, and what we do is we found these kids, just like stripes in a martial arts school, they're, they, it's so empowering when, you know, a kid hits 10 single passes on a jump rope and earns a star when they went from zero, you know? And then we right. have such a level system, unlike martial arts where, you know, you put your time in and you have to learn your form and this and that. It's completely, completely 100% black and white. So it's completely skill-based. Now you're going to have to work your way up. It goes from a real basic level. Right. But, um, you know, it's not like, you know, hey, you did your time and you learned your form. Here's like you either did a pull up or you didn't. And if you once you get your pull up, you get to move forward in your level. And it's so funny how, um, you know, the necessity is the mother of invention and how we get these kids that were from from zero to super fit. And it's just because we take them through this gradual and slow progression. They don't go straight to pull up. We have this whole we have a whole grip strength progression before they go to that. And they earn their way up the level. And, um, and there's no timeline, you know, if you're really motivated or talented, you can shoot up the level to some fast because it's, it's, um, so it's not just a, uh, but they also have to learn other things about nutrition and that, so like all things that I've taken from the martial art aspect. And at the same rate, we don't just do fitness. We focus on their character. You know, we have, uh, we have power session, power, uh, uh, community sessions where we talk to them every day and we talk to them about, you know, whatever, um, it might be respect or, you know, um, you know, um, citizenship, whatever it may be. So we, and we sit down and we talk to them every day. Um, we, you know, and I have a huge group and it's funny. It's because the kids that are the most doe eyed when they look at me, it's not the, the five year olds, it's the, you know, the hungry 17 and 18 year olds that I work with. So, um, and we've seen that in the martial arts. Uh, but the thing is, uh, we just, tr- we just transferred it over and made it fitness. And um, I think one of my my big hunger for creating this black and white system was, you know, my experience with the uh, with the martial arts, where there's so much gray area. Being a competitive martial artist, right? So mm-hmm. I don't know, <clears throat> you know, it's kind of the same thing in gymnastics. It's, it's in the eye of the judges, and in here the ju- it's for you know we know standards for CrossFit, right? It's always you you no rep or no rep, right? So you right. get it or you don't, and it's you know there's no bias there. And um, I wanted to cut myself out of there and make sure that I wasn't biased towards any of my kids. And I wanted to be something completely ge- legitimately earned. And um, the only way you can do that is to create a system that, uh, our level system, that is completely black and white. And, um, you know, so all my kids, honestly, it looks like a, like, um, like a fitness training in a martial arts school when you see it. Because they also say yes or no, sir. They take a knee. We all have our system. They line up. Um, it, 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 um, it works. You know, I wasn't trying to change it. The military and the martial arts have been doing it right for thousands of years, and I wasn't trying to, you know, you know, do something different. I know what how to train the masses, and that's, the, you know, the way you know that you copy the model. Right, and that's great. And I, one of the things that I want to point out is that whether whether we're talking to you or some of the other folks that we've had on that have strong children's programs, one of the things that comes up, the word that seems to come up when I talk to all of them is structure. And that I believe 
that at the core of it, I, I think all of us that trade in martial arts recognize that children benefit from martial arts, that whether they're one of the, one of the things that we say on the show or that I say on the show is that there's nothing else a child is going to do in their life that will give them more benefit than even just six months of martial arts. It's, it's going to last the rest of their life. And I believe at the core of it, it's that structure right. that a good instructor is giving to them. So as I'm listening to you talk and as I'm reflecting back on other conversations I'm, I've had, it's reminding me that that structure has become, I would say, even more important in today's society than it was probably when you and I were children. You know, we're, we're just about the same age because we've lost so much more of that in general society. And I think I, it creates an opportunity for martial arts schools to become more successful with their children's programs by providing more of that structure. Would you agree? I agree 100%. I, I, I would say that it's a, it's definitely comes down to the, when we talk about structure, um, it, it's the structure has to be the psychology of the student, right? I would say uh, we're 80% psychology, 20% mechanics. You know, we work the mind first. Right, and everything else will take care of itself because we know, you know, as martial artists or as an athlete, my limits have never been um, physical. You know, they were between my ears. You know, because my mind controls my body, right? So we basically, if we change their vocabulary, we change the way these kids talk. If we change the way that they um, that they think, right? And it's, you know, for that we, we, you know, we remove things from their their mindset, like the word can't, right? Um, we start changing their actions. And um, I think a great instructor um, focuses on their, you know, basically the, their their psychology of their their, um, their student. And I think that's what makes the difference, right? And, but like you said, it, it, it has to be um, uh, something, a, a structure that can we can recreate. It can't just be something that, hey, I, I you know, works with one kid and then not with the other. It's got to be something that, you know, it, you know, we can kind of implement to every child. And we, we know there's a lot of systems that work. I know you had, you had David Komar on. Um, he's, he's got great systems as far as working with kids and, and, um, and development. Um, you know, we do the same thing. We have everything. We have our own program that, that kind of works on teaching everybody from the first day here. And even my instructors and my coaches and my staff on CrossFit side from day one to infinity, you know, we have a, a system that, that, that works, you know, and, and it, it all comes down to this. It comes down to building, you know, uh, uh, a belief within some, uh, within the child, right. And, and, and removing their limiting beliefs, right. So the a limiting belief would be an excuse, right. Anything that they say that says, I'm not, you know, I'm not able to do that. Yeah. And I say, we'll tell you that yet. I haven't been able to do that yet. Right. That, I'm not able to do that. Or I can't do that. And then I prove it to them that they can. And once you prove to them that they can, right there, you won them over and you change their beliefs. And I'm sure you've done the same. It's happened the same to you. Right. And even though we're talking about kids here, I think anybody that's taught adults sees a lot of this stuff coming through that language adaptation, removing the word can't, trying to get people to, to shift into a more positive place can have the same sort of impact. Of course, you aren't going to instruct children the same way that you will adults. So your methods might be a little bit different, but those core beliefs, that core structure carries through. A hundred percent. It's all, you know, I, like, well, every book, every book that I read as an athlete that was, was, was uh, and every time we traveled, because we went everywhere, was on trying to make my, my mind stronger. It was, you know, it was, uh, you know, sports psychology or being able to, you know, or spirituality or trying to find, you know, you know, make myself, stronger mentally because we knew your the, the, your humps in life are a lot of they always come down to the same things and they're like I said before it, it's between the ears right well cool uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about how people can reach out and talk to you if, if they're looking to learn a bit more towards the end of the show okay but let's shift on now I'm sure you've trained with some wonderful people. I mean, you've already dropped some pretty big names that had me impressed. But who would you say the most influential of those people was? Oh, man. I've had some, you know, can I shoot off a list? 
Um, uh, yeah, but, yeah, you can drop a few names. All right. So as far as, well, my instructor was super uh, um, influential, and then I've had a tremendous amount of coaches. So, you know, everything from uh, my, my uh, you know, uh, three-time Olympian Juan Moreno was my, was my coach recently. Her Perez, gold, Olympic gold medalist. Um, Peter Radassos was my uh, initial instructor. Seven-time national team member. Um, you know, I've had... Uh, and then, you know, and then I think uh, as far as, you know, the people that have made me better, obviously my training partners and people around me. And, um, oh, I have him on me. I forgot him. Olympian, Olympic bronze medalist. Um, mm-hmm. I, but the people that have made me better um, as an athlete or as uh, just as a person in general? I'll let you answer the question however you want. All right. Um, so, okay. Let me, as a, so as an, as an athlete, um, I would have to say Steven Lopez. And the reason I say that is because, you know, I've fought Steven a number of times and, um, you know, he's by, hands down the, the greatest Olympic Taekwondo athlete of, of all time. Um, and by, by, by just by statistics. I mean, if you want to say debatably, um, what, whatever you want to say, um, as far as, um, uh, you know, in your opinion on how, on what kind of fighter they, they, he was, that's a different story. But, um, hands down, um, by just by his record, it shows that Steven Lopez, you know, being, um, a uh, two time Olympic gold medalist, five time world champion, um, you know, 20 years on national team. And he, um, he definitely raised my bar fighting him so many times. And, um, you know, after fighting Steven, you know, I've beaten world champions and, um, uh, uh, Olympic medalists and uh, some the, the best fighters in the world. Uh, actually, not some of the best fighters, the best fighters in the world, um, because he raised my bar. If that makes any sense. You know, it's that law of proximity where they you have great people around you, and you well, you, you you're able you have to raise your game. So um, right. I, I have great coaches and um, all these other things, but uh, there's no great motivating factor than trying to you know take down the the uh, Tiger Woods is Taekwondo. Right. Yeah, and it brings to mind a couple sayings, just to put it in a different way than, than what you said. Dress for the job that you want or to surround yourself with the people who are living the lives you want to live. Right. Because it's right. going gonna to raise you up. You become, uh, what, what's, there's another saying, you, you are the average of the seven people you spend the most time with, something like that. Right, right. You know, yeah, if you want to become a better martial artist, as I, as difficult as this can be, you shouldn't be the best martial artist at your school. You know, it's funny. Um, I actually uh, had a, a speech I gave to my kids yesterday about that, about um, you know being proximal, being close to your kid, uh, who you're around. If, if you're hanging around a bunch of losers, right? Let's say you got kids that are uh, drinking and partying all the time because of the fact that you know I'm so tribal, right? And, and most people are. Right, that you're going to be the best partier, you're going to be the best drinker of all of them, because you know I'm a winner and I want to be the best, at, at best in my group. And if your group is a bunch of you know people that are you know unambitious, you're going to be the most unambitious person of that bunch. So I, I be you know you know be careful who your friends are. You know, show me your friends and I'll show you who you are. And um, you know, and I talk I don't talk like that with my six year olds. Those are my teens that are my adults that are that I'm, I'm uh, kind of preaching to, but the, the truth of the matter is, you know, we, if you, you want to, uh, want to be great, surround yourself with greatness. And I agree with you hundred percent on that. Yeah. Wow. Cool. Well, clearly competition has been a, a thread throughout your martial arts career. And it's something that you're clearly very passionate about. And I'm wondering if you have a good story from your time in competition outside the the horrendous and mixed emotional bag of tearing your ACL, but maybe something from Olympic trials or something like that. One of my great fighting stories, I think something that, that remains memorable with me is in 2003, I was in the Belgium open and I was fighting France in the semifinals. And the, the French guy I was fighting was actually a 2001 French world champion, an amazingly talented athlete, really, really high energy, and I thought, if you can kind of read my energy, you can see I'm really wound up and high energy. So one of the great things about my coach, Coach Juan Moreno, a three-time Olympian, is that he's able to read me. He knows that I fight best when I'm kind of playful. 
right? When I'm not so serious, when I'm enjoying myself, when there's a smile on my face. And um, and he turns to me with uh, Bed Forrest about to start fighting. He goes, uh, you know what they call a quarter pound of cheese in France? And I go, uh, I go, what? I go, but they don't call it a quarter pound of cheese? And he goes, no, man, they got the metric system. We started going back and forth and doing this uh, the dialogue from Pulp Fiction. He goes, no, they, they call it a royale with cheese. And I go back, uh, royale with cheese? I go, that's right. I go, what do they call a Big Mac? He goes, he goes, Big Mac's Big Mac, but they call it Le Big Mac. So we started doing this whole dialogue back and forth. And I, was, I walk into that fight, and I have never been happier in my life. And, and with that happy state, I, we, I had one of the coolest, most amazing scraps with this amazing fighter who was just as energetic and just as wiry as I was. I ended up uh, taking the win. When the, and the final score in the fight was like was like twenty one twenty or something like this. But I think you know such a great coach was able to put me in a state. And this simple thing, you know, of going back and forth from the dialogue from Pulp Fiction, it can you know it stays with me for the rest of my life. That's great, and that's a, that's a lot of fun. There's a good lesson in there, and for anyone that's listened to the episode with Master Gordon White, who is the one that connected you and I. He had something very similar to say about knowing your athletes as a coach. And I think quite often when we think about coaching in the martial arts, we limit it to competition. But I think that there's a lesson to be applied in a much broader sense that when you're instructing a class, you could just as easily use the word coaching. You're right. helping your martial artists who, you, if it was any other sport, you would call an athlete, mm-hmm. get better. And the better you know them, and the better you know what makes them tick, the easier time you'll have helping them progress. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, every kid is different, right? And, you know, but the, you know, the underlying thing is that we all have needs, and if you can reach those needs, and you can kind of know those persons. Like some person, you know, somebody who would, was, you know, isn't there that day, maybe he could have got something to get him fired up. Right, and maybe that person just needed uh, to, he needed to have a fire lit under his butt. For me, it was I was I had no problem being fired up. You know, I'm already ready to go. I'm like jumping, pacing, and doing backflips. And he he just needs to make me enjoy it. He needs me to have me enjoy the journey and put me in a state where hey, I, like this, we're having fun, you know. And uh, once I realize that, I am relaxed. I'm smooth. I'm breathing better. Everything is really cool. So, you know, you know, kudos to my coach um, and uh, just, you know, putting me in, you know, this, this, this is one of my most memorable situations, I think, off the top of my head is, you know, just being able to change my state like that from high, really super intense to playful and energetic. That's great. Absolutely. And, and that's a fun story. You know, I just, I haven't watched Pulp Fiction in quite a while, but just envisioning that dialogue going back and forth with. Yeah. Yeah. We were, I mean, honestly, people were just, before a fight. Yeah. We're just having a, we're just having this conversation. And, um, so, you know, it's not typically the, 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 the normal, uh, uh, go out there and fight somebody's speech, you know? So yeah. something really stuck with me. So, so when I asked you about who you've trained with and, and, who was influential on you? You had quite the list, but who's not on that list that you would like to? Oh you man! Want to... So um, as far as not as, not as an athlete, but as a person, like I, I you know, I, I I've um, I'm a, I'm a person who's addicted to um, betterment, right? Whether it be uh, every year, I try to do several clinics and seminars, whether it be uh, as far as fitness related, um, personal development, or uh, you know, or you know the or, or uh, training children or whatever it may be. I try to do, you know, I have a, a plethora of, I collect uh, certifications, if that makes any sense, in books and, yeah. and audio tapes. Um, one of the things that, that come, nearing the end of my career, I, I um, one of the things that stuck with me in, in one of my self-betterment uh, programs was, um, you know, find somebody who, who's done it before, you know, find a role model, find somebody that you can, you know, um, that can mentor you that is that that you know and I was gifted I was so fortunate to to have these people around me but um uh, you know coming close to my retirement um I had sought out an old friend who was extremely successful as far as a person 
um, just overall and as far as uh, being a martial artist and a great uh, and phenomenal business owner. Um, and his name is Master Paul Malella. He's out of um, uh, upstate New York. And um, he is just an amazing person. I remember seeing him on the cover of, um, you know, all these different magazines uh, for, from as far as martial arts business and this and that. So, I, you know, I he coached me one time when I was 15 years old and fighting in Mexico. And, um, you know, it, we, we became pretty close then. He kind of stepped away from the sport taekwondo. And um, after, you know, 15 years, um, uh, I got a hold of his, his phone number because I hadn't talked to him in years. And um, I gave him a call and I said, hey, I'd love to come and uh, come see you and, you know, shadow you and, you know, spend some time with you. And so I spent about a week with him. And it was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And it changed my course because I was, um, you know, you know, I was an empty cup, you know, and I was just ready to absorb any information he gave me. And he gave me so much and gave me a better template. The, the bottom line is, like I said before, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm just, you know, because I'm always going to put my spin on it, especially with all the different versions I have of things that I get. And I just ended up doing it my way, which is was the ultimate uh, goal of any business owner, right? Life on your terms. But um, I, I, I was able to do that with the guidance of this phenomenal life coach. Um, and he's such a great dude. Uh, his name is Master Paul Malella. He's out of upstate New York. Um, and I'm very grateful for him. Yeah, he, he's changed my life tremendously. So, and, and honestly, like uh, the first thing I gave him was my curriculum. And he he laughed at me because, he, well, I laughed at me because he's better at dealing with people like that. But he thought I was crazy because I had way too much in my curriculum. I mean, I, honestly, it was a novel. It wasn't, it wasn't a curriculum, if that makes any sense. So he, we tweaked it and geared it down and simplified it tremendously. And, and to this day, you know, I'm, I'm uh, very grateful for not uh, having my kids quit at wipe up because they're already learning how to throw a, you know, trying to learn how to, being stuck at wipe up for six months, trying to learn how to throw a 360 round kick. Mm. Sometimes <laughs> less is more. Yeah, that's always more. And I've learned that, you know, because, there's, I can always teach that to people, but it doesn't need to be a part of my curriculum, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's a great lesson. Yeah. So. so let's kind of switch gears again. Talk about some entertainment stuff, movies. I mean, you're, you're an amped up guy, high energy guy, a competitor. I'm going to take a stab in the dark and say that you love a good fight scene. I do. I do. I do love <laughs> I, I'm not a big How did I know? I'm not a big fan of the wiry stuff, though. You know, like that 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 whole um, flying through the air, crouching tiger, hidden dragon kind of stuff. When it gets too, like, uh, like come on, man. When it gets too like that, I, I don't like it. It's not for me, you know. Um, some of my favorite movies, though, I've, um, I probably used to watch this all the time before I fought with um, with uh, Drunken Master. Yeah. I, and I just love the whole kind of, like, just flowing and silliness of uh and the athleticism of um of you know Jackie Chan that was always cool for me. Um those are you know and I just I guess I like playful fighting. I like being able to smile have a smile on your face and hit somebody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's what it should be. I mean my own coach, uh you know, Olympic gold medalist, I mean silver medalist, Juan Murano and his eighty eight Olympic fight, um Olympic trial fight when he beat um uh, the 10-time national team member, and he was a 17-year-old kid. If you look at him, he has a smile on his face the whole time, you know. And I, I mean, that's the that embodies the spirit of like, of just being of confidence, and I love that. What's better than doing something like something that you love and right. being able to enjoy it in the moment? I mean, so uh, often we we look forward or we look back, but we don't look right now. Yeah, you give me goosebumps right now. Just saying, like something you love, right? Being able to. Why would you just have that scowl on your face? If you love it, you know, it like, honestly, you know, we both go in there. We both, we know what we're getting into, right? It's not like I'm trying to take somebody on the street, but we're just enjoying the moment, smiling. I love that. That, that, that. That's my favorite thing when it comes to fighting, being able to really have it as a sport, you know? That's great. So do you have a favorite martial arts actor? Oh, uh, geez. Uh, favorite martial arts actor. Okay, I'm going to be biased. I have a... Um, I, I, you know, uh, Clay Barber is, a, is an ex-Taekwondo guy and he's a stuntman. So I'm going to have to say him because I love him as a person. 
Um, um, so, and I'm also, you know, but, you know, I, I grew up a, uh, a, a Van Damme guy, not a Bruce Lee guy, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but but it's, I would have to say, because personally I know him, um, you know, he's, he's a, a, a Hollywood stuntman, and now he's a stunt coordinator. His name is Clay Barber. He was a national team member. And I have a personal bias towards him. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I was always a, a Van Damme kind of guy back in the day. So since I have to say um, well-known, you know, like uh, like mm. superstar, Van Damme, and then uh, I, I'm not going to downplay uh, Clay Barber, but as a person and a, as a, I love what he does, I have to say Clay, Clayton Barber. Cool. I, I'm actually not familiar with him, so I'm going to Oh, man, he's super cool. He's a... Uh, you, 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 you ever seen Zoolander? Yeah. You ever seen Breakdown Fighting? Yeah. That's it. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. Right on. All right. Yeah. Nice. Well, I'll, I'll dig up some more information on him and, and link it over the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anybody that might be new to the show. We do show notes, links to all this good stuff that we talk about here. Perfect. So I heard you mention before books, you know, that you collect information and, and inspiration. So why don't you tell us about a, a book or two that you think everyone should read? Um, well, I think one of the, uh, if I had to give one book, um, I forget who this is. I think this book kind of changed my pace. I use my instructor, right? He's really, he, my original instructor, uh, I would compare him to Rocky, right? Uh, okay. A very wise thing to say, and it's very simple, and they're very tough, you know what I mean? Like the way he said things. But the same way, he's very rough, and he doesn't really sugarcoat anything when he says it. And I used to be, he gave me this complex when I was a kid, because I would always talk to myself. Um, and he would say, um, <laughs> he would say, you know, if you're anybody knows him, he's going to do the perfect impersonation. Tony, totally stop talking to yourself, right? He'd always say that, because I was always talking to myself, right? And um, what technically, I finally read in one of my books that, um, and hey, if this is... Uh, this is self-talk. This is actually something extremely important to you, the, the betterment of an athlete, right? You know, to convincing, I, I was, it's kind of, uh, you know, now we hear the quotes, you know, from Muhammad Ali, who says, you know, when I said I was the greatest, I wasn't trying to convince you, I was, I was convincing myself, right? Mm. So, um, I think, uh, uh, the mental edge, um, the, uh, the mental edge is a sports psychology book. Um, okay. and, uh, I got, uh, it, yeah, see, I just looked it up and I looked at the power of the internet, the mental edge. Here we go. It's right there. Um, maximize your sports potential with mind and body. Um, it's tennis bombs. And, oh, look at that. March 1st, 1999. So I got this book back in the day, right? So, yeah. um, it's a, I, if I have to give, give you one book to, as, as far as, um, um, just looking at yourself in a different perspective, it's, it's a sports psychology book and I thought it was really great. It's interesting that a lot of the books that people are suggesting are so focused on the mental aspect of martial arts. And it's interesting because I think most of us that have been training a while recognize that, yeah, there's the physical aspect to martial arts, but it's, it's not just fighting. I mean, we're, it's personal development. It's all, it's all these things. And yet so many of the books out there, not the ones that are getting recommended on the show, but I think I would guess the majority of the books that have been written about martial arts are about how to fight. Right, right, and I, um, that 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 seems almost uh, contradictory to me. Yeah, but that's but, that's it's that's always evolving, you know. Yeah. So I mean, if you put it, fighting is if you look at any fighting system, it's it's changed. It keeps developing and keeps uh, people because it's a chess match and it keeps changing. So obviously, there's some things that are you know the the baseline and things that work in fighting, but you you know the the technical aspect of it is always evolving, right? So the, yep. the, 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 you know, the importance, and if we can learn one lesson from being a fighter, is that it, continual growth and always changing yourself, you know, always evolving, right, to, or making yourself better. Because if you're not changing it, you're, you're actually only trying to get physically uh, uh, better. And if you're only trying to get physically better, uh, one day that's going to stop, you know, right. um, whether it be an injury or um, each age, you know, those things, I mean, I... Uh, Let's be real. I mean, I'm I'm 36 years old, and um, I have had uh, three knee surgeries. I have eight hairline fractures on my left foot. I have arthritis in my uh, my wrist and in my spine. You know, and this is from years of you know taking a beating. At the end of my career, 
I was, you know, I was glued together. So um, I had to be evolving and it's, and it's being smarter about my training. So it's, it's not solely physical. It's mostly about getting your mind in the right state, you know? Yeah. Very well said. So you've already accomplished a lot in your martial arts career. And, you know, earlier on in the episode, we heard you talk about your passion for bringing these martial arts principles into CrossFit and working with children and some of the consulting that you're doing. But what are the goals you have? What are you as an individual, be it martial artist or in life, what are you striving for right now? Um, so uh, to be a great father, right? That's first. And, um, uh, you know, I have a beautiful two-year-old daughter and um, family first and be a great husband. As far as a, um, a martial arts, we, I plan on having the uh, largest uh, kids fitness community in the United States uh, in group-wise. We are um, slowly bringing people on as far as that is. is uh, um, and um, we work with about uh, 10 groups, uh, 10, 10 uh, groups at a time, and we do it through a uh, seasonal cycle. So we're doing that, and uh, that's doing phenomenally, and we're really happy with that. Um, next, um, I would have to say that um, as far as my martial arts school, um, I can continually to uh, evolve. I mean, we're, it, and I couldn't be happier with what we're, we're doing, but I just don't want it to, to be the person that is completely, um, is too comfortable. Like I always want to grow and expand. So I'm really happy with my program. Um, it gives me more joy than anything else seeing, you know, my kids get their, their, their leveling up, you know, working with kids from everything from three to, you know, 68 years old, which is my oldest student. So we, you know, it, it makes me happy. It's my passion. Um, I stay away from the office um, because I don't enjoy paperwork. So um, I, I do what I love, right? I do, that's it. I'm able, I'm able to teach. And, um, and my biggest, I'm able to, um, I'm a creator by nature. I love to um, create programs and systems. And I spend a lot of my time doing that. But um, I'm not going to be handling checks and paperwork. I always outsource that. So my my goal ultimately is, um, as far as a martial arts school owner, to continue continually grow. Um, you know, we we may have some room for expansion down the road. It's it's not my complete amb- ambition to do that right now. My I think my remote coaching is where my focus is. I think um, if I put a lot of energy into that, I think I can be. Um, betterly used and not watered down my current system, if that makes any sense. It makes all kinds of sense. That's awesome. Those are, those are great goals, and I'm feeling inspired listening to them. And, and really, just this through this whole episode, it's you've got me amped up. There you go, baby. Talking. Let's go. So, you know, I'm, I'm, no, so, nobody can see it. So Fortunately, process. yeah, <laughs> for uh, for anybody out there that, that doesn't do cross it, that doesn't know what thruster is, it's uh, it involves squatting down, holding a weighted barbell up kind of at shoulder height, standing up with it, and then driving that weight overhead. And they never show up in just ones or twos. It's usually dozens at a time, and, and we'll leave you. I, I'm, I actually there's a, I have a, a tutorial of a thruster on the uh, Isopure website, so, if you're, I'm, uh, oh. so you can always do that if you want to. Perfect. Well, th- there, there's a wonderful transition. This is your opportunity to tell us about – how people can get a hold of you, what you can offer to them, if they want to follow you on social media, all that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you can follow me on social media. I'm, I'm pretty much uh, Facebook bound. I'm not a big Instagram guy or whatever it may be. So uh, uh, Facebook, Anton Graf. Uh, you can look me up, A-N-T-O-N-G-R-A-F. Uh, Juice Athlete Compound is our, uh, our website. It's, uh, the, it's the Juice Athlete Compound dot com. And, um, Lastly, you can uh, check us out. We're very active on our Facebook page, um, uh, which is Choose Athlete Compound. And you can check it out, you know, like us, and, uh, you know, you'll see what we're doing. And if you're interested and just want to see what we're uh, – if um, we can always kind of talk to you a little bit deeper about um, starting up your program. And it's basically turnkey, 
uh, getting a, 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 a kid's fitness program going properly. Um, everything from um, our uh, programming to uh, our level system to um, it, uh, our character development systems and, you know, being able to teach uh, pro- um, a, a little bit different. I want to say probably because a lot of martial arts people have experience, but maybe giving you a couple tools that might send you in a different direction. So, um, yeah, that's you can reach us. At, uh, we're very active on Facebook and also uh, juiceathletecompound.com. Great. And, of course, there will be links to all that in the show notes, whistlekingmartialartsradio.com. You guys know that by now, I'm sure. Well, awesome. It's been a lot of fun, really exciting. And let's go out on a high note. Do you have any parting advice for everyone listening? Um, you know, I, one of my favorite things, things is success is continual growth, right? It's not a place. You know, it's continually to, to strive to grow as a person uh, physically, mentally, and spiritually. So, um, you know, if you find yourself, um, a, a, you know, stuck in a place, force yourself to grow, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So, you know, push forward. Awesome. Master Graf, really appreciate your time. Had a lot of fun. Thank you, sir. It was awesome. Thanks for listening to episode 40 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Master Graf. Head on over to WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about, including Juice Athlete Compound, Master Graf's business that offers coaching and support to athletes, even those that aren't local. While you're there, if you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form. And don't forget to subscribe to our exclusive newsletter. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. If you'd like the show, please subscribe so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to help us out briefly, please leave us a five-star review wherever you downloaded your podcast. If we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. And don't forget to spread the word about our show to anyone that you think might like it. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick, like our super comfy Cloud9 sweatpants, and those are over at Whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.